My name is Steve Petracek. I'm the CEO over here at Seattle Avionics. What we're going to do here, if any of you have been watching the Olympics lately, uh, I watched some of the Olympics uh, actually quite a lot in the last few days. And we're going to do the electronic equivalent of going down the half pipe on a snowboard doing a quadruple flip in the unnatural direction, uh, 1040 degrees, something like that. In other words, in one presentation, I'm going to show you uh, something from my Mac, which is FlyQ Online, show you then how the flight plan that we create there feeds to your iPhone, and then how it goes from your iPhone onto your iPad. So we're going to use three devices in the course of this. For any of you who saw some of the presentations we did in November, the last time I tried this, I uh, failed miserably, did not work at all. So wish me a little luck here. What I'm going to do first, as I said, is to begin with FlyQ Online. FlyQ Online is a web-based program which just became available recently. So it's FlyQ right here. All right, let me expand the window and show you what this is. FlyQ Online is a web-based system that is a complement to FlyQ EFB on the iPad and the iPhone or FlyQ Insight on the iPad or the iPhone. Essentially, it's designed to work on any Mac or any PC using Chrome, using, in this case, Safari, using um, Edge on a, a PC, whatever web, Firefox, whatever it is, whatever web browser you use, there's no software to preload, there's nothing to install, it just works. So what I'd like to do here is to plan some flights. So let's kind of begin here. Well, let's try to do it this way. I'm, if I hit, this button right here at the top, there's one that looks like a bit of a crosshair. I just clicked that a moment ago, and what it did was it used the approximate location that my computer, think I'm doing this on a Mac, that my computer thinks I am, and it automatically zoomed the map on the right-hand side of the screen um, to approximately where I am. And on the left-hand side of the screen, it shows me a pane with all the airports. If you're familiar with FlyQ, any of the FlyQ products, the presentation here will look pretty familiar. It's a split screen layout. If you grab the bar in the middle, you can you know, change the split screen to make either side bigger or smaller. You can't go to single screen, it's always split, but you can change the size of it. On the left-hand side, there's a series of tabs. So the tab right here is for airports. You can pull up a specific airport, and I'll show you more of that a little later. You can pull up lots of weather graphics, like uh, US weather graphics and so on. Fuel prices, uh, flight plans, you can create them. Look at your recent flight plans, uh, whatever it may be, pull up your documents, and so on. There's a lot here. This basically has most of the features that are in FlyQ EFB, and then some, especially to do with weather and flight planning. So let's talk about flight planning, because what I want to do here is to actually plan a flight. So I could plan a flight from the Seattle area down to somewhere in California, but that's kind of what I always do. So instead, what I'd like to do is to plan a flight from somewhere else in the country. Turns out I used to live in the Kansas City area, so which is why uh, Wichita's airport is on the screen right now. I was looking at that a few moments ago. So let's plan a flight. Two ways that we can do that. We can use the plans tab, and then there's a series of sub tabs, new, recent, this is obviously my recent list, nav log, and so on. I could type here the airports I want, my to and my from. I can, it will automatically add fuel stops for me, which is very cool. And when it adds the fuel stops, and you'll see this, it not only picks ones that are on the way, but it'll pick the fuel stop that saves me the most money because it knows what the fuel prices are. And it won't just pick the cheapest one kind of that sees in the area because it takes into account how long it will take you to fly to that out of the way uh, airport to maybe save 10 cents, okay? So it optimizes your flight based on fuel price. It will also optimize for best winds over here. So there's more options too. There's a button up top that says show all options. They can show you more. I'm not going to do this. What I'm gonna do is just show you the quick way of creating a flight plan, which is pretty straightforward. You type into that top search box, and you can type in, if you wanted to just look up an airport, like my home airport, it's PAE. I just type PAE there and it shows it to me. But if I want to plan a flight, I type in just a little more. So I'll type in a ICT, which is Wichita, and we'll go to Chicago, the V, which is ORD. Then I'm putting a V at the end. That part's not so obvious. This works in FlyQ EFB on the iPad and the iPhone as well. But the V means plan this route instead of in a straight line on Victor Airways. If I fl flew a jet, I could put in a J. If I wanted no routing at all, just two points, I could put in N. 
Uh, so a number of other options that you can put here. I'm just gonna go with Victor Airways. So let's plan this flight. I just hit the return or the intro key on my keyboard. So it'll take it about maybe 10 seconds or so to plan the flight. So in the meantime, uh, the system's quite live. So I'm just gonna move the map a little bit. Oh, there it goes. So the flight plan loaded, it automatically filled out, uh, it zoomed the map to the appropriate size so I can see the flight plan. There's a few things I should point out here that are pretty cool. First, all of these waypoints, including, it looks like it planned a fuel stop here for me at C75. We'll talk about that a little later. But the fuel stop was automatically planned for me. On the bottom, on the right-hand side, there's what we call the profile view. You can turn this off, by the way. I'll show you how to do that a little later. But the profile view has a yellow line showing you the altitude that the flight planner planned it at, which looks like pretty low. Looks like 5,500 feet. And then it has black lines because we planned it on Victor Airways. Each of those black lines is the MEA. Then here, you see a dip here in the line, a little V shape. That means we landed at C75 to get fuel. You also notice that it put these colored uh, areas on the map here. The colored areas are airspace. Colored blue, of course, would mean that it's a class B airspace. A little lighter blue would be class D. Uh, class C would be magenta and so on. All right, so now we have our flight. We have a fuel stop that took, what, 10 seconds to do. But let's take a look at how weather is going to affect us. Now, I have to point something out, especially for those of you who may be watching a video recording of this a little bit later. It turns out today that the FAA, or the National Weather Service, I guess, had some kind of a problem. They had a server literally blow up. So a lot of the weather data that we normally get from them is not available at this moment. So a couple of things that I would normally show you to do with winds aloft or to do with tasks and METARs, I can't show you. You're going to have to just visualize it. But let's go to the map. There's a button at the upper left-hand corner of the map. It says layers. It's a stack of paper. I can turn on either a static radar or animated radar. I'm just going to turn on the static one because during a video presentation like this, uh, too much movement, too much animation often doesn't carry too well while it's being broadcast. So one thing to notice, kind of a big problem here. It looks like there's a very large storm system going through the Midwest right now, and I picked an ideal time to fly through it. In fact, if I look at my map here, I'm gonna zoom this a little bit here. Looks like I picked a fuel stop that I have to cross quite some nasty weather to get to. So as a practical matter, being a, uh, what I like to think of as a sane pilot, I'd rather not do this. So let's modify our flight plan a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, well, this is a fuel stop, right? So I wanna pick fuel that's cheap. So how do we do that? It all, well, it picks C75 for me automatically because the fuel is cheap, but I can turn on a map layer by again hitting that stack of papers button. And let me turn on fuel prices and see if there's anything else that's maybe good price in the area. So green are a fuel prices that are low price, like there's a 395 here at the bottom. There's another 395 over here. Uh, the magentas, the 555, 591 are the really high prices. And the orangey ones in the $4 range, it looks like, um, are kind of mid-priced. So I immediately know that there's fairly inexpensive fuel over here. The good thing about whatever this airport is over here is that it's also out of the way of the bad weather. So let me show you how I can make that modification to my flight plan. So I'm going to move my, I'm just going to drag over here, drag this dot to over here. It will say, oh, well, what airport did you pick? There's a couple in the area. Which one do you want? By the way, if you, these are showing me my airports and nav aids. If there were any nav aids or fixes, you can use these tabs at the top to pick those. But the comment again shows you only the nav aids and the airports. I'm going to pick Washington Muni. So now the system is going to recalculate that flight plan. Notice on the left-hand side of the screen, instead of, I think it was C-75 before, we have AWG as a new airport. Okay, so very handy to do. I should also point out something else. Now, as a practical matter, I probably also want to uh, get rid of or move at least some of these points here. So for example, if I want to maybe move this out of the way, I'm gonna maybe try to pick just a fix. In fact, let's cancel this for a moment. I'm gonna switch this momentarily to an IFR low chart. And I'm just gonna move this guy over here so instead of that nav aid, let's pick this nav aid to move it to. And 
what else would be good? Oh, looks like the system's thinking a little bit here. This is the part where I said it's a little bit like uh, trying to do a double or a quadruple twist while you're uh, doing a half pipe on snowboard. So it looks like the National Weather Service may still be causing a problem here. So I'm going to actually just reload this. And it should pick up where I left off. So for example, if I take a look at my recent uh, flight plans, There is that flight plan. I'll just reload that guy. Okay, so I didn't pick up the changes that I had, but you get the general idea, is that when you turn these layers on, it's pretty easy to move the, uh, to pick new airports to look at. Like I will, if I pick say C75 and I click the button that says map, it'll move the map to that point. So that's just kind of handy. I'm gonna zoom the map out just a little more Turn on my fuel layer again. And let's just move that guy just as we did before. So I'm going to move that to uh, the same point that we had before, Washington Muni. And it should automatically save the flight for me. There it goes. I'm going to turn off the radar now. And just so you can see things a little more clearly, instead of a sectional, I'm going to switch this to the road map. Just so you kind of see what we've done here. I can zoom out a little bit. So what we've done is we've taken a bit of a detour. On our way to Chicago, we're gonna make a, a turn to, let's just again, turn the radar on for a second, to try to get rid of some of this weather here. The problem, of course, is that a flight is live. It happens in time. So one of the problems that you can happen, uh, can happen to you is that you can take off when the weather's great, of course, and then by the time the, you land, the weather is expected to be bad. So let's take a look at that. I'm gonna, instead of fuel now, I wanna look at my METARs and my TAFs. So I'm going to turn on the METAR and the TAF layer. I'm going to turn off the radar for a second. All right. So the way that FlyQ works is, generally speaking, whether it's FlyQ EFB in the iPad or FlyQ online on the web, if it's green, it's good. If it's red, it's bad. If it's yellow or orange, it's in the middle. So, for example, I know that there is a, a green METAR dot here. If I click on it, or actually it's a TAF right now, it shows it to me, what the details are, and so on. But the thing about weather, as I said, is that it changes over time. So there's a button on my nav log. I could manually change the zoom level using buttons on the map itself on the lower right side. But on the left-hand side in the nav log, there's a little bar at the top. The first button on, in that bar says map. If I click the map button, it resizes again the map automatically to my flight plan. So I'm going to do that. So the first thing I, you may notice here is that uh, you have some red dots on the right-hand side of the screen and green dots on the left. That's, of course, because that's where the radar is. But radar uh, storms tend to move. So normally what I would do is I would turn on the winds aloft layer, and I would set it to whatever altitude I wanted and look at wind arrows. I can't do that here because currently we don't have US winds because of the National Weather Service problem. But we do have them from NAV Canada. So you can still see what the wind arrows look like. Again, red is a strong wind. Uh, orange, like this one over here, is a little bit lighter. And if you can see it here, there's a couple of green arrows up here in Manitoba or the top of Ontario. So those means that those are lighter winds. So that means at, there's a timeline here at the bottom. So that means at about four o'clock, which is where I'm pointing on the timeline, then there's an altitude slider here. The altitude slider is at 12,000 feet. So maybe at 18,000 feet, I'll click that. The winds change, but I'm not really gonna fly that high. I'm gonna fly at maybe 9,000 feet or maybe even all the way at 6,000. So you can see how the winds aloft change based on time. Like instead of four o'clock, if I want to say what do the winds look like at eight o'clock or at one o'clock, I can see that or maybe even later. You begin to see that the winds aloft can change over time, okay? So this is the way that we do weather planning and fly queue online that you, we call it four dimensional weather because you can use the altitude slider to look at uh, air mets and sig mets, winds aloft, other things like that based on the altitude, but also based on the time. All right, so ignoring the winds for a moment. In fact, I can get rid of this little box here or I can just turn off my winds aloft. Let's just take a look at the METARs again for a second. Let's go back to the time planning. So 
on the timeline here, most of the timeline bar is white, but some of it is green. Starting at five o'clock through looks like about 11.30, the timeline becomes green. What does that mean? That means that's the time where we actually have our flight. That's our flight plan time. So I'm gonna zoom the map in a little more. Maybe one more tap. Okay, now at that level, notice that there's an aircraft icon somewhere here near Columbia, Missouri. That's because my timeline slider is set to seven o'clock. So at seven o'clock, it's telling me that uh, this information here, uh, that we're about halfway through our flight. So I wanna see if the weather's gonna change a little bit later in the flight. So let's say that I take a look at this and I move it to a little later. Looks like the colored dots are still green, meaning the weather's still good. Maybe move it to 11 o'clock. Notice that here at 11 o'clock, when we were going to land, the weather is actually better in Chicago. I see green dots. Then if I move the timeline back to five o'clock, we see red dots. So in this particular case, it looks like as we continue in the flight, the weather is actually going to get better. The weather is actually going to get better for us um, as we fly along which is pretty darn cool, I think you have to say. What I like to use this for, though, is actually kind of the reverse, where I, I use this to make go or no-go decisions, where as I'm flying along, or as I'm planning my flight, rather, if it looks like the weather is going to be bad at the time I propose taking off, if I move the timeline to a little t later time, or maybe even, say, the following day, often you can get weather that looks quite a bit better. Okay, so we use the timeline in particular uh, as a way to find when the good or the bad, depending on your perspective, weather is. So it's a pretty cool thing to do. Um, that's generally how that you handle the system. That's how you take a look at uh, the way the weather changes over time. What other, th couple of other things I want to point out before we begin moving to the iPad and the iPhone. One is that when we change that fuel stop to AWG, notice that it automatically says it's a stop and it added 38.8 gallons. Well, why did it do that? Where did it get 38.8? That wasn't the original value that was putting in when we were making a fuel stop at C75. That happened, I'm gonna click on the 30, anything is blue and underlined or just plain blue, you can click on. So when I click on that, when you, ha when you wanna add a fuel stop, you can pick, how do you wanna fill it? Do you wanna fill it to your original takeoff level? So if you began the flight with say, two thirds of a tank, you're going to only refill it to two thirds of a tank. Or you can pick automatically top off the tanks. You know, so if you don't have a lot of people in the plane, you, you know, not a lot of cargo, you may top off the tanks. Or if you really want to, you can pick to add a very specific amount of fuel should you choose to do that. Mote the default though, is to automatically fill to takeoff level. And what's really cool about this is if I go in and change my flight, I'm just gonna try this. So right now, uh, we're putting in 38.8 gallons of fuel. But if for whatever twisted reason I decided I want to make uh, quite a bit of a detour, like maybe go and then move my flight plan line to here. I have absolutely no idea what this is. I'm gonna go to uh, Hebron Muni. So the system will go back, it'll recalculate everything. And what you find is instead of 38.8 gallons at AWG, it now has to put in a whole a fuel tank of 48 gallons. In fact, we actually ran out of fuel, um, I think, on the way over here. So the idea is that the system will recalculate automatically all of your fuel stops if you make any changes before that point on your flight plan. Very slick. FlyQ EFB and the iPad doesn't do that yet, but FlyQ, note the word yet, but FlyQ Online does do that. So this is a very, very cool way to plan the flight. Just one more thing, then we go to the devices. Once you plan the flight, you wanna do something with it, right? So obviously this will automatically sync with FlyQ EFB or FlyQ Insight. But if you want to use some other product, I've heard of some other iPad apps, or some other devices, like you can do that. So there's a button bar in light blue here. Again, it says map, then it says share, then reverse, and then clear. I'm gonna hit the share button. When I do that, I can export my flight plan just like as a PDF. I can either email to somebody, just type in their email addresses like that, just type in whatever you feel like, or I can hit the button that says download and the system will download it for me. So this is my printed nav log. 
I can fly this. It has the, uh, all the frequencies for my nav aids. It has latitude and longitudes for the airport. It has the Morse code identifiers for the nav aids and so on. You can, of course, email that to somebody or whatever you like. I'll close that window and just go back. However, if you want to put this onto something electronic, like if you have a Dynon, now Fly QEFB, whether it's running now on the iPhone or on the iPad, can wirelessly transmit a flight plan uh, to Dynon uh, Skyview and to AFS. So you don't really necessarily need this with Dynon, but you can export the GPX file, it's called, um, to it if you like. You can also, if you fly a G1000 or some kind of Garmin device uh, that takes SD cards, you can use the download or the email option to take this flight plan, put it onto one of those SD cards, put the SD card in the top slot for your G1000, and the flight plan can be automatically loaded. So there's a lot of cool ways that you can use this. Also, I should point this out, although it pains me somewhat to say it. There's a little line of text here that when you email this to someone, all of the emails that you send automatically include clickable links that work automatically with FlyQ and with ForeFlight. So if you want to plan the flight using FlyQ online, but for whatever clearly twisted reason you may have, you want to run it on uh, ForeFlight, you can just click on the link from the email that gets sent to you and run it on ForeFlight as well. Okay, so that's how the share feature works. But since we're still staying within the FlyQ e ecosystem, we don't have to do any of that for it to work on any of the FlyQ products. So now let's try something really tricky. Let's now take a look at what FlyQ 3.0 looks like running on your iPhone. So I'm going to minimize this. Actually, get rid of that. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, and this is where we had a problem uh, the last time I tried to do this. So what I'm doing is, I'm actually, this sounds kind of weird, but I'm creating a movie recording from my iPhone. And that, of course, is not a movie recording, that is me. So let's take a look and change this camera to my iPhone. So take it a little bit of time uh, for it to calibrate to the new screen size. A little longer than I might like. Here it is. Okay. So uh, then I'm going to just tell it to go into full screen view. All right, so here's my uh, phone, happens to be an iPhone 10. Um, I have, not surprisingly, a number of our apps loaded. In the lower left corner, I have FlyQ EFB, so I'll tap on that. FlyQ EFB is now running on your iPhone. This is brand new in 3.0. And feature-wise, it is absolutely the same as the iPad counterpart. All of the same ADSB connections, 20 different ADSB systems. It has the full panoply of all the different maps. It has the data recorder that we'll talk about, augmented reality, synthetic vision, plates on the map. All of the same things that you get on FlyQ EFB on your iPad with two exceptions. You can't do split screen because the screen's not big enough to split. You wouldn't be able to read any of it. And um, because of the screen is also kind of very, very tall, but not very wide, it doesn't work very well in what's called landscape mode. That is, you can't rotate your phone 90 degrees and have it uh, appear wider than it is tall. You have to use it in taller than wide or what's called portrait mode. Okay, so how do you use it on the iPhone? Pretty simple. If you tap on the screen, you see the toolbars come up. Uh, there's a stack of paper icon here. It looks like layers. Notice that it takes over the full screen temporarily. On the iPhone, we do that a lot because the screen just isn't big enough to have the kind of pop-ups that overlay other things like we do on the iPad version. It still works the same though. So I can pick maybe IFR low, go with my METARs, I'll turn on fuel prices, and I don't know, turn on traffic. There's no traffic to show, I'm not displaying any ADSB data, but just so you get the idea. I click done, and there we are, okay? So the fuel prices are on the map, you see the traffic, if you're familiar with FlyQ EFB on the iPad, you see that ring, which means that the traffic uh, layer is on, and so on. Very, very fast, very, very smooth. Radar, you should see a nice batch of radar right over here. Oh, look at that, here's our flight plan, okay? Or actually, it's one very similar to it. If I don't do anything for another couple of seconds, that bar down the bottom, the tab bar, will disappear to give me more screen real estate. This is particularly important on the iPhone, but as you probably know if you use the iPad version of it, we also do that on the iPad. If you tap anywhere on here, 
it will come back for you automatically. So I'm going to hit the plans button down the bottom. And here are the, some of the flight plans. So the one that we just created, I've, as you can see, I've practiced this a couple of times. Uh, but if I load in the flight plan that we just created, which originally was ICT to C75 to ORD, let's load that guy. We'll take a look. The flight plan is now loaded. You can scroll it and so on. A couple of things here I want to point out. Uh, right now, you're looking at this, essentially an iPhone screen blown up to the entire size of your computer monitor. It's obviously not that big on most iPhones. So one of the features that's been always part of the FlyQ line products has been a great way to make all the fonts bigger. So right now, the Navlog fonts are relatively small. There's a bar around the middle of the screen, the lowercase a and a capital A, the word wind, uh, one that says rev, reverse, clear, and edit. If I tap on the one that looks like the little a and the big A, the fonts get quite a bit bigger. I can just scroll it, of course, to the right or left, or up or down, whatever the case may be. Again, that font size button is really handy. You can make it bigger. One of the other features we added for, for the iPhone, especially for smaller iPhones that don't have as much vertical space as this one does, this bar along the middle above the, uh, the font size picker, this is Navlog, WX Brief, and IKO Flight Plan. That obviously is how you get your weather briefing and your IKO plan and all that. But what's really cool about it is if you double tap on any of those buttons, it takes away all the stuff that's normally, all the summary information about your flight plan goes away to give you more space to look at the nav log itself. If you double, uh, just double tap on any of those again and it gets smaller, okay? So very simple, very easy way to do that. Again, I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time in the iPhone version because frankly, the iPhone version isn't materially different than what's on the iPad, but I do want you to see a few things. So in the upper right corner of the screen is what we call the status indicator. So has it been in FlyQ EFB since uh, the last major release, since version 2.0? If I tap on any of those buttons, I now see my GPS, my weather, my ADSB, and now the flight recorder, okay? So all of that information is still there. I can turn on, for example, my GPS simulator. Hit either, If I hit the back button, it goes back to all the other uh, tabs or hit done. It goes back. If I tap on my map, I see my simulator is now in here running. Let's get rid of those fuel layers. Okay, so the same simulator that's built into FlyQ EFB when running on the iPad also works on the iPhone as well. Other things, let's say you go to the weather sub tab, you load your weather forecasts and so on. One of the great features about FlyQ EFB though is a wind optimizer. So towards the top of the screen, where it says nearby and winds and gallery and such. If I tap on winds, normally what I would say, oh, I guess we still have some now. We have some winds aloft information now coming onto the screen. So a green is good, red is bad. Notice that there are no red bars on the screen, meaning that at all altitudes, hitting in the direction that I'm going in right now, um, I'm always getting a tailwind, which I don't know about you, but always seems to be the reverse for me. So often you see red bars going one direction um, at certain altitudes and green bars going uh, in a, one direction at another altitude. So this is a great way to optimize your flight. All right, again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the iPad, uh, on the iPhone. One other thing that's kind of cool about it though, is if you go to the, uh, if you go to the top box in FlyQ EFB on the iPad or FlyQ Online, there's a large search box at the top left of the corner of the screen. There is here too but we don't have the screen real estate to make that box big enough to do a lot of typing. So when I tap into that box at the very top left of the screen, it gets bigger. So I can type in long things like an entire flight plan if I wanted to, hit the search button on my keyboard, it pops up and so on, okay? Also, if you haven't seen FlyQ at B3.0 yet, even on the iPad, one other change that we made actually was uh, necessitated by the iPhone, but we also carried it through in the iPad version as well, is that on the previous version of FlyQ, the buttons that you see on the screen, the direct to button below pain field, the plus FP, which means add to flight plan, the button next to it, which means show me the procedures, and the map button were a two by two cluster on the right-hand side of that cell. Now there are four big, easy to hit buttons 
below each airport. They're much easier to hit, works out much, much better on the iPhone. There was no way this could possibly work um, any other way on the iPhone, but even on the iPad, we did that too, okay? And of course, if you tap on the airport, the airport information is very, very similar. You get uh, the same tabs that you do in FlyQ, EFB on the iPad, the general information, the weather, the proceed. So like the weather, oh look, it's supposed to snow soon, lovely. Procedures, the AFD documents, NOTAMs, services, and other nearby airports. It's all there, it's all the same. And tap on any of these and see them big, which is terrific. So again, like many things in FlyQ, you just tap on them and you see them large. So all the same information is here. Uh, it's a very, very easy way. Like again, here's um, ICT, this is Wichita Airport. You can pull up, oh, if you tap here, you see what it looks like from the air. There are tabs at the bottom, so I can pull up the FAA diagram or the Seattle Avionics diagram. I can turn wind arrows on and off and so on. You can even use a scribble feature that's built into it. So let's turn the winds off. I'll hit scribble. And if I zoomed in here a little bit, and this is a place I really want to look at, I can circle that. I can even change the colors on this if I really want to, or the, um, let's see, where's the color one? Yeah, I can change the colors, like make it green, do whatever I want to do. Hit the scribble button that looks like, a, well, a magic marker. Again, and we're done. So if I look at the SA diagram now, you'll still see what I scribbled before. And if I wanted to, I could put that in the map as well. Okay, so again, I'm gonna stop demoing the iPhone here because there's simply not a lot to show. What you can do on the iPad, again, with the exception of split screen and with the exception of being able to put it into landscape mode, everything else you can do on the iPhone. So FlyQ EFB is now available in handy pocket size. Okay, so again, I told you that I'm gonna try three different devices during today's demo. So that's two. Let me unplug my iPhone. Screen will get really boring for a second. I'm plugging in an iPad. Spoiler alert, I just got an alert on my iPad telling me who won a ski race competition. I'm not gonna tell you who it, did, who it was though. Okay, so again, I'm going to open up that video recording thing, tell it to now use my iPad. And this should pop up a new screen here, I hope, in a moment. I may have to kill the QuickTime player um, and start this again. But I'm going to give it a second to see if it figures it out. Here we go. Okay. So if I do full screen, all right. So hopefully now you can see what my iPad screen looks like. So let's take a look at FlyQ EFB, and I'm going to do the rest of the demo on the iPad, mostly because everything is a lot bigger on the screen. So I'm going to hit FlyQ EFB over here. All right, so just launches, like UEFB looks you know, very similar to the way it's always looked. Not, nothing overly steps out at you as being materially different. But uh, let's do a couple of things. Let's go to the plans tab. And what I'm gonna do is to load in that flight plan that we were working on before. So this is the same flight plan as we had before. Again, just to be clear on this, the concept of being able to make the fonts bigger is the same button here, so I can make them nice and big. It's a little a, big A button on the left-hand side of the screen here. Or I can look at my weather briefing, nice and big. I can look at and file my KO flight plan and so on. It's all right there, easy to get to. So all of that's very, very similar. Not a lot of differences here. But I want to point out a neat feature that you may not, you, which isn't a new feature in FlyQ EFB, but it's a very cool feature and very useful feature. So assume that before I had to make the modification for avoiding the bad weather, I was assuming that I was flying from say the Kansas City area maybe, um, all the way to Chicago. So I downloaded the data for that. 
If I click the button, it'll, it's at the very top of the screen, towards the middle, that looks like a down arrow. Notice that I have a magenta line here. The magenta line is my new flight plan. But see, I planned badly because ahead of time, I thought that I was going to be flying from Kansas City, which, by the way, is in Missouri, at least the largest. There's a Kansas City in Kansas and a Kansas City in Missouri, but Kansas City, Missouri is where I was flying from. So I thought I'd be going to Chicago. I didn't think I'd have to fly into Iowa. I didn't plan on, it looks like I'm even making a bit of a detour into Nebraska. So by having this image on my downloaded data of where I need to go, I know that I need to tap on Kansas and Nebraska and Iowa to download all the data I'm going to need for this flight. So the whole concept of having a pictorial representation of your flight plan line on the download area is super convenient. I don't think anyone else does that. It's very neat. Um, in case you're curious, we also invented a feature which was later copied by some other product that begins with the letter F to download some data. So, for example, if we have this here, this is what we call the pre-flight checklist. It goes through and it automatically checks the particular flight in question. It uses red to indicate when data is required and so on. So it looks like I'm going to need to download some data and that there's a download button at the upper right corner of the screen that I can download just the data they need for a particular flight. It's what we call the pre-flight checklist and it's accessed through the icon that looks like an aircraft taking off at the very top of the screen just below the 9.41 a.m. I have no idea why it says 9.41 a.m. It's not even near 9.41 right. right now. You get the idea. Okay, so let's take a look at what we can do here. So let's go to the map function. And what I want to show you now is some of the new features in the Brock. One of the most exciting features from my personal perspective in the Brock is the ability to have our flight track recording system. It would have been pretty easy to simply record the flight track and spill it out as some data file that you can look at and other things. That's not the FlyQ way though. The, with FlyQ, when we add a feature, sometimes we're not the first person to add a feature but we like to do the feature in a way that no one else has thought of and really try to make it more useful. So let me show you what I mean. The first thing, of course, is that the flight recording is automatic. When you go and you fly, it automatically records your flight. Let me show you a little bit how that works. If you look very closely, if you're familiar with FlyQ, in the upper right corner are the status indicators. Previously, there were four of those. Now there's a fifth one. The fifth one at the far right side is record. It's right now off because we're not moving. If I tap on any of those, I now have my GPS category, my weather category, my ADSB category, and now the new one, the flight recorder. So what's cool about that is it will, again, it will automatically start recording if I'm really flying. And where it says not recording towards the upper right corner there, um, it will be a green thing that says recording. You can also manually, you don't have to do it automatically, you can manually hit the start button and begin recording if you want to. All of the flights that you've taken are here, graphically represented to you. We also make a good guess uh, based on your GPS start and stop where your takeoff airport was, where your landing airport was, and make that the from and the to. There's a title that we add automatically to it, and you can add a comment to it. You can edit this too. So if I click the blue edit button, instead of a pre-flight lunch, maybe make that a pre-dinner flight. You don't have to type in uh, a description, but you could. Personally, I don't like lattes. So let's go with cappuccino. Okay, I like cappuccinos. So let's say I get a $100 cappuccino or a $100 hamburger or a $100 whatever you want to get, ice cream cone, whatever. Hit the done button and that's saved. Again, now you have that graphic image. If you want to see that graphic image of the flight on your main map, all that you have to do is to tap on that big graphic image. And we have a new map layer. I'm going to turn on, I'm going to hit the map box here. It'll say map. And at the lower right corner of the pop-up, notice that there's a new item. It says track, flight track. So this is my flight track. It shows it to me like that. We're taking off from Payne Field and we're, uh, we actually flew a little more than this, obviously, but.
So it takes it a second to load in the 3D data. I think it was loaded here. I think I downloaded it. Maybe not. No, I may not have downloaded the 3D stuff. But that's generally the idea on the way that you can do that. Other things that you can do on here is since it does tie into the built-in GPS simulator, I can hit the GPS button, and this is where the simulator was in the previous version of the product. So I can do things like I can make this go a lot faster by making my speed way faster or slower. I can, ma I can manually pause that and then jump it to a particular spot on the flight, the beginning or maybe towards the end. Play it again from here. Okay. So a lot of ways that you can uh, look at the flight. That's how you can use a simulator with it. Um, what it also now, here's to me, oh, notice you can even do things like have track up on one side, north up on the other side, and really, really confuse anyone looking at the screen here. Let's go back temporarily to single screen mode. So it's a little bit more clear what we're doing. And I'm gonna show you some more things that you can do with a flight recorder. So we, I showed you how to use the edit button to rename it and things like that. And the pause button, let's hit pause over here on that as well. But once you record something, you often do want to do something with it, get it out of fly queue into some other app. So there's a button next to the play button. It's kind of the generic Apple button um, for action, do something, send something, share, whatever you want to call it. That's the button that looks like a box with an arrow coming out the top. So I'm going to tap on that button. That's also how you delete it. But if you're using a system like, say, Cloud Ahoy, and you want to review it, um, if you don't know what Cloud Ahoy is, it's a terrific web-based um, analysis program that uh, is used by a lot of uh, law pilots, also by a lot of CFIs and their students. If I select Share GPX, the system automatically, since I've installed the Cloud Ahoy app, I can send this uh, by email to whoever I want to, or I can send it to Cloud Ahoy, which is what I'm doing right now. So it opens up the Cloud Ahoy app. I'm not going to do it, but you can import the flight uh, just by hitting the button right here at Cloud Ahoy. Okay. So very, very simple. The integration between FlyQ EFB and, and Cloud Ahoy is simple. It's like two buttons. Let me double tap to go back here. Okay. Another thing you can do is how many of you use Facebook? I know I do. I'm pretty sure that a lot of you guys do. If you don't use it yourself, use it to take a look at what your grandkids are doing or your children or you know, see what um, topics that you care about, what's happening in the world. A lot of people use it. So one of the things we put into this is a button below Share GPX that says Share Image. And what Share Image does is pretty cool. You can send, uh, I'm gonna cancel this for a second. So that little image that you see on the screen, our flight track, where the green dot is where we took off from and the red dot is where we're landing. I can push that image to say Facebook when I say share image or to, uh, to Twitter if you have Twitter installed or uh, Instagram, whatever you like. But the Facebook one is actually really cool. So I'm going to give a little shout out here. I'm guessing that a fair number of the people listening to this presentation are in the Pacific Northwest. So I'm going to hit the Facebook button. And I can either notice this little graphic here. So it's really big, easy to see. And we add some stats on the top. We tell you what the total distance your flight was, your duration in hours and minutes, your average speed, and the maximum altitude that you went to. Okay, nothing super tricky. We're not putting in engine data or something like that, but enough so that if you want to show somebody who's probably not a pilot what your flight looked like, this is a great way of doing it. You can post it to your own account, or there's a button bar at the top where it has my name, and then there's, on the far right side of that, there's an arrow button. When I click on that arrow button, I can actually post that to things like uh, my friends or to certain groups. So for example, uh, I said a lot of people here are probably um, in the Pacific Northwest. It turns out that in the Pacific Northwest, we have a trade show coming up uh, this Saturday and Sunday. It's the uh, Northwest Aviation and Conference and Trade Show, I believe it's called. It's in a place called Puyallup, Washington, pretty close to here. So there's a lot of people from the Pacific Northwest. There's also a number of different uh, Facebook groups that are specific to those folks. One of them is the one at the top here called Flights Above the Pacific Northwest or Fat PNW. If I want to take that graphic image and post it to Fat PNW, I select that, click my Done button, and then I can write something here if I want to. Uh, let's see. 
image from today's live webinar. Exclamation point, hit post. It'll tell me that it's posted. Then I believe if I go to my Facebook app, there you go. Here we are on Facebook. So the thing I just posted is already live, available on this system. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, let me tap back and go to fly QEFB. All right, so those are some of the things that you can do in terms of export and so on. Let's talk, we have a couple more minutes, so I wanna talk about the augmented reality feature in the product. So the way that you get into 3D mode in fly QEFB has always been, there's a 3D cube on the tab bar, rather on the button bar on the left side. So if I tap the 3D button, I get my 3D view. Let's begin uh, simulator. I'm gonna actually load a flight plan here. Okay, and tell it to do a simulation of the flight plan. Turn the sim on and go. All right, so the simulator is now working in 3D mode. But if I tap that 3D cube button another time, check this out. Now it's engaging the camera that's on my iPad, my iPhone. And obviously I'm sitting at my desk right now, so it's, you kind of lose a little bit of this. But the general idea is wherever you point your camera, it's showing you pictorially where the airports are, color-coded. So for example, uh, we're, again, we're on a flight plan right now, so these aren't actually the ones near me. These are the airports near the flight plan that I have. In fact, I'm gonna split the screen. So this is pretty cool. So I can have on one side of the screen, let's in fact turn this into maybe track up mode. So I can see from a 2D perspective where I'm going on the right hand side. And then on the left hand side, I have my 3D view, my augmented reality view rather, shows me where north is, for example. And as I move this around the cockpit, so it's like straight out the window, move it to the right hand side and so on. I know that IAB is 7.1 nautical miles away. It's blue, so it's controlled. I know that 13 miles away, K50 is right there. It's magenta, so it's not a controlled tower. All the airports are here. There's a, a view that looks like kind of a thumbnail view of airports in the area. If I tap on that, it becomes nice and big. And if I move that around, see it shows me from an overview point of view, from a top-down point of view, it shows me where all the airports are that I'm seeing out my camera view. Incidentally, if I want to take a picture of this, there's also a button that looks like a camera shutter um, towards the middle bottom. If I tap on that, I take a picture of the screen like this. Or actually, let's do this one. Okay, so take a little picture. If you are flying on this and you want to calibrate it, you hit the front button. The front button basically begins a calibration system because the uh, the compass basically built into an iPhone or iPad isn't all that great. So this is a calibration system. So pretty neat stuff that you can do. You can also change using a layers button, very similar to the layers button that you see when you're actually um, using 2D mode. Tap that. And right now we're only showing the public airports. If I tap private airports, notice SN46 popped up. See, pops in and off, depending on whether or not I have it selected. If you fly helicopters, you can turn on helipads. There may not be a lot of them here um, near Wichita, but in, uh, where we are in Seattle, there's a million heli helipads. Probably no seaplane bases. You can also turn on one airports with short runways, runways less than 2,500 feet. And if you're flying kind of in the middle of nowhere, there's a slider button that runs from five nautical miles to 100 nautical miles. That tells the system what kind of range to look at, how far to look out in terms of showing you the airports. So it defaults to around 20 or so. If I make this say 100, you see more airports will appear. So now when it's only five, there's nothing on the screen here. If I move it from five to a bigger number, you see more airports begin to appear, just like that. Also take a look at the radar view uh, the overhead view in the lower right corner of that area. In fact, 
Let's go back now to maybe full screen view. So as I change this, the radar, the overview thumbnail in the lower right corner shows more airports. And I see more airports out my video view too, like that. So if you're flying in the middle of a, you know, like Los Angeles or New York or something, you probably want to make that nice and tight. If you're flying in Montana, you want to make it nice and large. So a lot of things that you can do there, a lot uh, that's very handy. I'm going to switch now back to the 2D view because some of the other features in the product, um, I, we don't talk about quite as much, but they're important. For example, I mentioned that um, if you're a helicopter pilot, it's handy to show helipads from the, three, from the uh, augmented reality view. Well, it turns out that we also now added, I'm gonna jump now to JFK in New York. So here's the airport. If I wanna jump the map immediately to that point, you look at those four buttons down the bottom of JFK, and the one that's on the far right looks like a map. I'm gonna tap on that. It brings a map right to it. This, of course, is a sectional with METARs and TAFs overlaid to it. But if I were flying a helicopter, I may want to turn on a new map layer. So I tap my stack of papers, and I have a couple of new layers. One is helicopter. Check this out. So with a helicopter map loaded, you see that the helicopter layer is now embedded. In fact, there are actually multiple helicopter maps in the New York area. It's really complicated. The helicopter maps are now overlaid on whatever base map you like. So this is a sectional but maybe I can make an IFR low or maybe just make it roads, whatever is convenient here. So the helicopter maps, you can zoom in, you know, a lot of detail on them and so on. A lot to see here. Okay, so that's the way that the helicopter maps work in the proc, the overlays. Similarly, the Gulf of Mexico maps are, are very, very similar to that. So if you fly, especially helicopters in say the Gulf of Mexico, there's a new map, I'm going to turn off the helicopter layer, and turn on the Gulf of Mexico layer. That's another FA chart. Uh, I'm told that these are mainly oil rigs and things like that. Those are here for you. And you can mix and max that too. I can turn on the helicopter layer at the same time. And notice that there's actually like two different helicopter layers on top of each other in this area. It's kind of unusual. So here you have uh, one helicopter map being superimposed on a lower resolution helicopter map like this, kind of strange. Okay, so those are a lot of the new features that are in FlyQ EFB 3.0. Again, to recap, uh, the big one, of course, is running on the iPhone. And I'm gonna do, if there's a request, I do one more thing with the iPhone, so I will attempt to do that. Um, FlyQ EFB now runs on the iPhone, number one. Number two, the ability to have all this cool data recording, which is automatic or manual, or whatever you like, you can export it to Cloud Ahoy, you can, ex you can export to Google Earth to do a review of your flight. You can send the images to Facebook. You can do whatever you like to do. Very cool. Another feature that's terrific, of course, is the augmented reality feature view, which you get to like this. By the way, I do have to point out that the augmented reality view uh, does require an iPad that is uh, relatively new. It doesn't work on the original iPad mini and it doesn't work on the iPad 2. Um, I'm not sure if it works on the iPad 3 either. It takes any other uh, newer iPhone or newer iPad, it works perfectly fine on, okay? And then of course the helicopter maps. Um, we also have, if I take a look at my download section, I also have a whole new set of downloads. So we now have the maps for Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Belize, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, whatever. So you can now download the um, approach plates and the airport diagrams for those areas as well. Also baked into FlyQ EFB 3.0. One other thing I want to say is uh, the price of the product is normally very, very good. Um, at the end of this presentation, we're going to tell you a way that because you watch the presentation, I think you'll get an email, but there'll be some kind of a coupon code that you get so that you can get it at a discount. Normally, the application is $139 a year for the IFR plus VFR or $69 a year for the VFR only. There's no difference in any of the features at all. You get all the augmented reality. You get uh, the flight recorder, all the new stuff, the iPhone version. All of that's the same price. The only difference between IFR and oh, IFR plus VFR and the VFR version is you don't get the approach plates 
in the VFR version because they're IFR, and you don't get the IFR low or the IFR high charts. You still get the geo-referenced airport diagrams. Um, you get all the other features in the VFR. Also, if any of you are flight instructors or students, one other feature, well, really two. When you go to the data recorder, if you want to export a flight, if you're a student pilot and you want your CFI to see your flight, you can hit the export button there, the action button, share the GPX, use the email feature to email it to your flight instructor. And then your flight instructor can actually email, can open it directly on FlyQ or on, on CloudAway if you want to. But you can open it directly on uh, FlyQ EFB from the email and take a look at the student's flight directly from FlyQ EFB, including using all the simulation functions, the 3D features, um, all of that great stuff. All of that is available um, to students and CFIs. And stu we have very, very special pricing for students and CFIs as well. So if you're an active CFI, instead of that 139 price per year, you can get it for just $19. And your students can get a VFR only version for that same $19. So if you're any way interested in flight training because you're a student pilot or because you're a CFI, FlyQ EFB is just $19 for you. You can get that price by going to our homepage and there's a big graphic at the upper right-hand corner of our homepage that talks about how much we like student pilots and CFIs. So, I did get a request for one other thing, so I'm going to attempt to do this, um, and that is to create a quick fly pl flight plan on the phone and then show it on FlyQ online. So, let's give that a spin. Again, if anybody has any other questions, I would point out that this would be a great time uh, to ask them by typing into the interface, uh, the um, GoToWebinar interface while I do this. And somebody here should be able to take a look at your questions. All right, so let me try to load up here. Let's see. It's me, it's my phone. All right, so here's my phone. I'll open up FlyQ EFB, and let's just tap into the search box and create a really quick flight plan. I'll take a flight from Payne Field, my home airport, to LAX, and do this on Victor Airways. Hit the search button. It'll create the flight plan. You don't have to be connected to the internet, by the way, while you do this. Um, if you are connected to the internet, then the flight plan, of course, is automatically transferred um, to the cloud. And the reason why that's important here is because now you see the flight plan. I can go to the map button. Here's the flight plan. So the question was, can you now see this in FlyQ online? So the answer, of course, would be yes. So let me go back to my web browser. I will type in FlyQ online. Maximize the screen here. Now, if I go to my plans tab, and look at recent. Here's the flight plan we just created, pain field to looks like well, RBG to MCC and then LAX. Tap on this. It'll load the flight plan here. It's now in FlyQ online. So how tough was that? Okay, just kind of works. All right, so as I said, uh, there's a number of other goodies that you should get in your inbox to do a discount uh, for taking a look at this presentation today. If you have any other questions about things that you want to see, what I recommend you go to is actually youtube.com slash FlyQEFB. And we have a very, very robust uh, channel on YouTube that has tons of videos. I think there are actually like 35 or so videos. First category here, here are all the things that we've uploaded recently. All the videos about FlyQEFB 3.0, what's new. There's kind of an 11 minute short version and here we have a, about a 35, 40 minute longer version with more details. If you just want to find out about the iPhone, that's there, or about augmented reality, it's this video, or about the flight recording and export features, it's there. If you want to know more about FlyQ Online, this is a great overview, it lasts about 11 or 12 minutes. Then there's individual videos on all the details on the weather, including a lot of the things I couldn't show you today because of the problem with the National Weather Service much more detail about online flight planning, a lot more about airport information and exporting. 
If you're new to FlyQ or you're thinking about becoming new to FlyQ, we have a series of very short videos that go over some really simple stuff like just five minute video that gives you the basics. Then another video shows you just how to download data, how to look at airport information or flight planning or weather or IFR or ADSB, whatever it may be. All of these are between five and about 10 or well, one minutes, 15 minutes, but generally between about five and 10 minutes. We have another category that tells you what's new. So all of these what's new videos are all the different versions of FlyQEFB as they've come along and so on. Uh, there's also, if you take a look at our website, oh, here's another thing, actually, another good resource is our, um, oh, look, webinar starts in two hours. This is our blog you can get to from our main website, which I'll just go to here. So this is the seattleavionics.com website. Lots of information here. Here's that CFI and student special as telling you about is available right there. Little area in the middle has about products. If you have a Dynon or an Aspen or a Benix King or whatever other device you have, this is where you can buy your data. If you want to know more information about, say, FlyQ, you can go to products, click on FlyQ EFB. We have even more information about the product, more training videos, also documents. So you can download, say, the pilot's guide and take a look at that. It's a PDF file. You can also get to that from within FlyQ EFB itself. It's one of the documents that you get um, in what we call the Documents tab, which is available in both the iPad and the iPhone version of FlyQ EFB. So this should load the um, kind of big documents, about 150 pages now with lots and lots of detail. But this is a getting started guide. A lot of good detail about the product, telling you where to get help, watching videos, you know, a table of contents and so on. All right. So hopefully that's give you, given you a good sense of what FlyQ EFB 3.0 is. It's the biggest release by far we've ever done. We also, of course, uh, improved performance on the product quite a bit. We fixed a lot of bugs. Um, I would say one bug I would mention in particular, there is a bug right now with Avid, with um, sorry, with Dynon support. We'll be releasing a beta today to people. If you are ha having a problem connecting FlyQ EFB to your Dynon system, send an email to support at Seattle Avionics and we'll get you fixed up today by getting on the beta. So that's easy to fix. Beyond that though, when we, every time we launch a new release, we take a look at crashes and we take a look at uh, problems that people have been having um, and so on. I have never seen a release ever, and we've been doing this for 15 years. I've never seen a release that's had so few crashes, so few complaints, so few problems. Um, we spent a lot of time in this release uh, getting it just right. Uh, some people complained that it took us a little too long and maybe they were right. But the side effect to that is we took the opportunity not just to add features, but to make things faster, work better, work smoother. And that was a really, really big emphasis that we had in this release. So that I'm going to leave the webinar running because by leaving it running, we can continue to answer any questions if anybody has that. Uh, but I'm going to stop talking now. Again, for Seattle Avionics, my name is Steve Podrachik. And I really appreciate you spending the afternoon and evening with us.